Well, we've made it through Psalm 119, about, oh, a few minutes from now, we'll get there. Um, and did you notice how much of that last hymn that we sung has to do with heaven, has to do with God's great day when he comes to reconcile everything to himself, that, that final harvest, that time when, when we go home. And so as we come to the end of this journey in learning to love and, and live the word of God, um, we get to these last two stanzas and we discover that there is a theme that runs through it. And it is waiting and longing for the Lord's salvation. So let's get right to it. Let's get right to Psalm 119. Um, and what I want to do first of all is just do a quick review of things that David learned as he was learning to love and live the Word of God. Well, first of all, we saw that that is something that we, we need to do. And as we do so, we begin to see things as they really are. We, we take those rose-colored glasses off and, and we take all of our preconceived notions away. And the Word of God helps us to see things as they really are. And as we dig into His Word, it's, it's not the things that we are able to do for ourselves, but what the Lord has already done for us. And by our obedience and faithful walking with the Lord according to His Word, uh, our quality of life is enhanced. We see God's hand and we see His blessing. Along the way, then, we find that no matter what happens, God's Word is a comfort to us. And as we give consideration to His ways, uh, to His statutes, to His precepts, we find that there is great, great comfort in that, no matter what our situation might be. Then things turned a little bit in the psalm, and David focused on the goodness of the Lord and the godliness that comes as we learn to love the Word of God. We grow in our relationship with Him, and we, we gain a little bit of godliness as we do our part in faithful obedience. The next uh, couple of stanzas had to do with holding on until eternity. David found himself in, in the crucible uh, many times where he was proven time and time again by the uh, activities of his enemies and even by his own flesh. And he found out that uh, by holding on to God's word, he could hold on until all of eternity. We found out that uh, that favorite verse, that familiar verse, Lord, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to our path. That's where that verse comes from, Psalm 119. And so the, the quality of God's word is a lamp and a light. It helps us then to withstand wickedness. How do we stand firm in this day, in this age where there is so much going on in the world that's just wrong in God's eyes? We, by standing firm on God's word, are able to withstand wickedness. Then we looked for uh, a couple of moments uh, at keys to loving and living God's word. Last Sunday we saw God's compassion and suffering, and this last installment in the series has to do with waiting and longing for the Lord's salvation. When we break it down to its essentials, this is what David was up to. This is what he had expected. This is what he uh, learned in the end. And he had his heart so set on following the Lord, on being uh, a man uh, who lived according to God's word, who learned to love it and live it, that he found, I think as we're finding, as we take more of God's word in, we find that we long for, we wait for the Lord's salvation. We, can't, we just can't wait to see uh, what he has in store for us. And so um, we have to ask ourselves in this first stanza, starting in verse 161, uh, what are his activities while he was waiting? He gets more specific about that as he gets to verse 166. And that first part of that verse says this, I wait for your salvation 
O Lord. Now, this was an interesting word, this idea of waiting. We think of, talk about waiting. Man, have you ever, it seemed like it, it takes us a long time to wait at a traffic light. Let me tell you, folks, around here, it ain't nothing. Uh, I sat in traffic. It took me an hour and a half to go 18 miles. Wow. Wasn't that something? This idea of waiting. Now, I, I was getting a little bit impatient, so I'm not going to complain about traffic around here ever again. If you catch me, correct me, okay? Uh, but this idea of waiting, we have wrapped in our minds the, the sense of, of time that we have, the time and space. But David's idea of waiting for salvation has as its focus the hope that it waits for us and this idea of waiting uh, for the salvation that the Lord has for us is this expectation of a realized hope. This, this only occurs four times. This particular Hebrew word only shows up four times in the entire New Testament. Two of those times are here in Psalm 119. And so this idea of, of hope that is realized and the hope that can only be realized through experiencing the Lord's salvation. Yeah, that's what David meant when he was talking about, I wait for your salvation, O Lord. Yeah, I, I know it's coming. I, I, I can't wait to see you face to face, this realized hope that the Lord has for us. And so what are, uh, uh, what do we see in, in the context? You know, th there's always a context uh, when we're waiting. Uh, sometimes we're waiting for, for someone to arrive. Sometimes we're waiting for a call from a doctor, for example. Uh, the, the, the context of this waiting that David uh, is experiencing here uh, is summed up in verse 161 where his heart is trembling at the Lord's word while rulers were persecuting him without cause. I wanted to start with the heart trembling. You ever had your heart tremble? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it scares us. But uh, the idea of a trembling heart here is that heart that stands in awe of God. When we see God act, when we have a, we share God sightings frequently here. When we see something that God does and we are speechless, when we know that it is something that only God could have done, wow, that's what David is talking about here. Standing in awe of God's word while he's being unjustly persecuted. Rulers persecute me without cause. The injustice of those who are wicked and evil and want to do anything to tear down the name of the Lord, uh, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, tear down the Lord Jesus Christ and those who follow him. That's the context. That's the context where David is waiting, expectantly waiting, this realized hope when we will be taken away from all the trial of this world and this life. So what are David's specific activities while he's waiting? You know, what, what, do you, what do you do when you're waiting? When I was sitting in, when I could see red lights in front of me, and that, uh, I think the traffic light was way up on the next hill. What did I do? Did I, did I grumble? It? Did I say, oh man, I've, this GPS must be wrong. Yeah, sometimes we, we at Grumbly, we, come on, we're wasting time here. What are some of the activities that we need to do specifically while we're waiting for our salvation? Verse 162 says, I rejoice in your promise like one who finds great spoil. You ever seen the, the little book, the Jesus Person Pocket Promise book? Just a little thin little book. And uh, someone collected all of the promises in God's word and just put them in one volume. And it's available for those who need to be reminded of God's promises. Hundreds of promises that God gives us in his word. 
David rejoices in his promises like one who finds great spoil or maybe like one who finds that big buck uh, this last week. Yeah, We rejoice in God's promises just as much as and maybe even more than finding something that we, that we really want. Verse 163, I hate and abhor falsehood, but I love your law. Yeah, that's something we need to do while we're waiting. We need to hate falsehood. We need to hate falsehood, but even more so, we need to love God's law. So many times uh, we get stuck on what we're against. We need to be more about what God is for and what we ought to be for. We need to love God's law at least as much as we, we hate the falsehood that is going on in the world around us. The next thing, verse 164. Seven times a day I praise you for your righteous laws. Oh, seven times. Seven times? Is that all? <laughs> or seven times? That many? <coughs> we know the significance of the number seven. Yeah. Full and perfect and, and, and complete. These times a day when we just take a pause, we take a break, and we praise God for his righteous laws. Wow. Yeah. Um, verse 166. I wait for your salvation, O Lord, and I follow your commands. Verse 167. I obey your statutes, for I love them greatly. Verse 168. I obey your precepts and your statutes, for all my ways are known to you. Yeah. This, this whole aspect of faithful obedience comes into play here. That's what we do while we're waiting for the great salvation that God has for us. We follow his commands, we obey his statutes and his precepts because he knows all of our ways and we need to do it uh, out of love, out of love for him. We see this idea of waiting for salvation. We see the context in which David was waiting for salvation. We see his activities but what is a specific result? Look at verse 165. You notice that I passed over that verse. Great peace have they who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. Wow. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. Have you found, as you have exercise that discipline of consistency and taking in God's holy word. Have you noticed uh, an increase in peace? No matter what the circumstances are, no, what, no matter what the situation was, have you seen an increase in peace? Great peace have they who love your law, and then nothing can make them stumble. Wow. Nothing can make them stumble. You know, when we're at peace, we tend to be drawn to the light of God's word, aren't we? We don't stumble around in the darkness. When we're not at peace, we're looking for answers in all the wrong places, and sometimes those answers are, are uh, the deceivingly found in stumbling around in the darkness. And that's not right. That's not right. Great peace have they who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. So then I wait for your salvation. And I follow your commands. I obey your statutes, for I love them greatly. I obey your precepts and your statutes, for all my ways are known to you. Wow. God has peace for us while we wait. Hmm. Then David follows that up in this last stanza of the psalm by talking about longing longing. David says, I long for your salvation, O Lord, in verse 174. What is this longing for salvation? It's different from waiting for salvation. This is an internal thing. This is a heart level thing that David's talking about here. It's a deep desire, a deep desire to be saved from the external evil Everything that's going on around him. 
be saved from that unto, be saved unto eternal peace in the presence of the Lord. Great peace have those who, what? Who love your law. And so that great peace creates in David's heart this longing to be separated from all that's external to his walk with God. What are his, uh, what, what's the context here? How do we live life while we're longing for the salvation that God has for us? Well, how do we do that? We see it in verse 175 and 176. Let me live that I may praise you, and may your laws sustain me. We'll stop there for a moment. Yeah. How do we do it? We delight in, and we get our sustenance from the law. Yeah. That's what we do. We, we keep digging. We, we don't give up on something that we don't quite understand. We keep on digging down, and we ask the Lord by his Spirit to show us what his word means. And maybe he'll direct us to another verse that will help us to understand. God's word is incredibly consistent. It's, ex- ex- it's expectedly consistent because it is truth. Yeah. When we delight in and find that God's laws sustain us, we live that we might praise him. And then, in verse 176, a very interesting Interesting verse. I have strayed like a lost sheep. I have strayed like a lost sheep. David was honest with himself. He did not see himself as perfect. He saw himself as a lost sheep. Isn't that interesting? Who is asking the shepherd of the sheep to seek his servant, for I have not forgotten your commands. So, as we live life while longing for salvation, while we're delighting ourselves in God's law, while we're being sustained by God's law, what is it that David specifically requests? We see a series of verses that begin with the word may. May. Hmm. May what? May my cry come before you, verse 169, the first one in this paragraph. May my cry come before you, give me understanding according to your word. When we cry out, we cry out in faith. We cry out trusting God to hear us and to to do what? To give us understanding. Verse 170, we see, may my supplication come before you. May my request come before you and specifically here, deliver me according to your promise. What is salvation? It's that deliverance. It's that separation from the external evil. Deliver me according to your promise. Verse 171. May my lips overflow with praise. Well, yeah, may my lips overflow with praise. May the words that come out of our mouth praise God first. That should be the first thing that we say. Why? The rest of the verse, for you teach me your decrees. When we're teachable, we should be able to repeat it and repeat it back to the Lord in in praise by the words of our mouths and by the actions of our lives. Verse 172, may my tongue sing of your word for all your commands are righteous. Yeah. Oh, there's lots of music out there. There's lots of songs out there, isn't there? But there are songs that specifically do what? There are songs that specifically sing of his word. That's what we need to be focusing on. May my tongue sing of your word. Why? For all of God's commands are righteous. And then the last, the last may. Notice the first five are may, my, may, my, may, my, may, my, may, my. But then look at the last one. May your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. May your hand be ready. I I have given myself to you. I'm waiting for you. I'm longing for you to save me. 
And so may your hand be ready to help me. No matter what my situation is, may your hand be ready to help me. For I've chosen your precepts. Well, we come to the end. We come to the end, and we have to ask ourselves a question. What did David learn as he grew in loving and living the Word of God? We've been able to share that. We've been able to think about that. And it's, it's a never-ending process. While we wait and long for the Lord's salvation, we need to be growing in loving and living the Word of God. And so I, I turn to the Prince of Preachers. He has been uh, a help to me along the way. The Prince of Preachers, some of you know who I'm talking about, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And this is what Spurgeon wrote in a, in a book called The Golden Alphabet. The Golden Alphabet, as you may remember, each of the stanzas, you know, the, those funny looking uh, words and symbols at the beginning of each paragraph, that's the Hebrew alphabet. And this is a, an acrostic poem, really. That each of the stanzas, this last stanza, starting at verse 169, begins with the letter tov, or the, the, the t sound, the T sound. In our, in our language, every, every verse begins with that. And so Spurgeon called it the golden alphabet. This is what he wrote as he closed out uh, his thoughts on Psalm 119. We are drawing near to the end. The pulse of the psalm beats more quickly than usual. The sentences are shorter, the sense is more vivid, the strain is more full and deep. The veteran of a thousand battles the receiver of 10,000 mercies rehearses his experience and anew declares his loyalty to the Lord and his law. Not boastfully, but still boldly, he places himself among the obedient servants of the Lord. His petitions gather still more force and fervency. He seems to break into the inner circle of divine fellowship and to come even to the feet of the great God whose help he is imploring. This nearness creates the most lowly view of himself and leads him to close the psalm. Prostrate in the dust, in deepest self-humiliation, begging to be sought out like a lost sheep. Wow. Praise the Lord that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. He came to seek you out. He came to seek me out. And he came and he saved us. And we are forever grateful for what he has done for us. He has given us his word. He has given us his promises, his statutes, his precepts. All of those words for God's word he has given to us that we might, that we might turn to him. That we might await and long for the great salvation that he has for us. So on this Thanksgiving Eve, there's so much to be thankful for. Dean's going to help me as we uh, serve the Lord's Supper tonight. And will you just take a moment before uh, we serve the communion and thank the Lord for what he has done in bringing you salvation.